How you guys doing? Good. Uh, just uh, any any dads here who your, your wife is on women's retreat, just raise your hand for me. Man, just great job in bringing your kids to church. Um, thank you so much. As a pastor, both I know this personally, but also in pastoral ministry, there are countless men who only come to church because their wives take them. Um, and, and so thank you so much for, for, for doing that work. And, and hopefully now you might come back and just thank your wife for the impact she has now that you're seeing it. Um, if you're new to the church and, and you came during the church music, uh, I, I want to welcome you. My name's Eric. Uh, today, you're going to hear all, in a sense, what the Christian life is, is really about. Uh, you know, sometimes people think Christianity is about doing the rules to keep God on your side. Uh, that, that's not it. Uh, or you might say, well, whatever Christianity is about, it, it's not about transformation because I have a cousin who's got a greater rap sheet than me. I got an uncle who oh, cusses uh, like a language, like it's a new language, and he's been going to church forever. Uh, and, and so that's not it at all. Uh, what, what really the faith is about is God wants us to be faithful, uh, not to gain anything from him, but in response to how faithful he's been. Uh, he wants us to be compelled to live transformed because of his transformation in Christ. And, and, and in this passage, what we're going to look at is how the faithfulness of God compels ours. Go ahead and take your Bible with you and open it to Romans chapter 4. If you need a Bible, there should be one down in the seat back pocket. Uh, or one thing you can do is if you have a bulletin, just flip it over. And uh, you'll go ahead and see the passage right there. It's a long one. And so, uh, you know, I've never, um, I might cash in my hour sermon ticket today. You know, I spent almost three years not going as long. And so we'll see how it goes. But I'll do my best to work through the material. So really what I want to do, though, is I want to look at this uh, through three headings. And, and the three headings I want to look at is I want to look at the faithlessness of people. Uh, then I want to look at the irony of God's faithfulness. And then I want to look at how God's faithfulness compels our life. The faithlessness of people, the irony of God's faithfulness, and how God's faith compels. Now, before we get into that, let me just do a quick background. Uh, remember that uh, Paul has been working uh, to convince the church and to encourage the church to their need for what the gospel gives, which is a righteousness that's sourced in God and God alone. And last week, Paul talked about how that righteousness is found through faith in one man, Jesus Christ. Now, in this passage, we remember, as was the key in a lot of Paul's churches, he had a mixed audience, both Jew and Gentile. And one thing he wants to do is here, he, he wants to, number one, show that this whole concept of being justified by faith might be revealed in the New Testament, but it's been sourced into the Old. In other words, it's not a new kind of thing, but it's found, it's, you can trace it all the way back to the beginning. Because if we're going to say something is from God, it has to be shown also in the Old Testament. And so Paul's aware of that. Yet he also wants the church to not just know it, but to be compelled to live differently in the way they look at each other, in the way in which they live their life. And so we'll go ahead and see if we could solve this. So let's go. Uh, we'll begin with the faithlessness of people. And I did some shifting around here. Uh, and so what Paul starts is he wants to talk about the faithlessness of people. And that's really found in verses 1 through 3 and 6 through 8. And you know that every culture has heroes. Every um, group has, you know, people that they love. I'm a Bronco fan, and so we love John Elway and Peyton Manning, and we're waiting to go back to those days. Um, in California, our hero is whoever made the In-N-Out Burger. We, we're thankful for him. He's on our Mount Rushmore. Uh, we're not sure of the heroes of Vancouver, um, but for the Jews, the two Mount Rushmore figures, probably George Washington would be Abraham, and, and then the great... Perhaps Abraham Lincoln the, the, would be David. These are monumental men of faith for the Jewish people, for the Gentile Christians, and for anybody who calls God their God. And what Paul does is he says, I want to look at Abraham, and I want to look at David, 
and I want to show you what they discovered about their life. Let's, let's first begin. He, he starts with Abraham and he says, the first thing Abraham learned through the course of his life was that he couldn't be faithful to God on his own. Take a look at verse 1 and 2. Paul says, what then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? And what he discovered, verse 2, if in fact he was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. In other words, Paul says, well, people might look at Abraham and think he's his great testament of faith and righteousness. But as best as he was, he couldn't be faithful to God alone. Now, remember, he's speaking to a group of people who have a great comprehension of the Old Testament. And so I imagine him saying, remember Genesis 12, 10 through 13. If you've been in your Bible, you'll know that Genesis 12, 1 through 9, God comes to Abraham and gives him the greatest promise ever. He says that I will make you the fulcrum point of eternity. I'm going to bless you and the whole world will be blessed because of you. And Abraham says, let's do it. And God says, fantastic, here's what you got to do. Go to the land I'm going to tell you. Abraham says, fine. In 1210, he goes to Egypt, a a major superpower. And, And as he's in Egypt, he looks around and sees how great the things are, and he gets nervous. And what he says to his wife is he says, you know, these people might see how good you look, and they're going to kill me. So say you're my sister. And then that's how we'll get out of it. I'll let you read the whole account later. But what I want you to see is that Abraham, as soon as he trusted in the promise of God, turned around and trusted in his own scheming. And realized that as great as God's promises were, he alone didn't have righteousness enough to trust in them and live by them fully. Abraham learned in his life that he couldn't be faithful to God on his own. And yet, Paul says that's one of two things he learned. The first thing he learned, he couldn't be faithful. But the second thing he learned about God is that God was over willing to overlook his faithlessness and still credit him as righteous. Take a look at verse 3. Paul says it like this. What does the scripture say about Abraham's life? And he quotes from Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteous. Abraham learned on his own he couldn't be faithful, yet God was still willing to look at his faith and overlook his faithlessness. Paul says, I'll enter another person that we love, and that's David. And what did we learn of David's life? And and Paul addresses this in 6 through 8. And he says, the first thing David learned, just like Abraham, is that he couldn't be faithful to God. Verse 6 says, David says the same thing when he speaks to the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. This is from Psalm 32, a prayer where David is praising God for being considered righteous, even though his sin should make him unrighteous. David says that he also, Paul says he learned that he couldn't be faithful, and yet... Just like Abraham, in learning that they couldn't be faithful, they still knew God was willing to overlook their faithlessness. Take a look at verse 8. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. And so what Paul says is our two heroes learned that in life they could not come before God on their own. But they needed what God has in faith righteousness and so paul says that's the great point is that the best of us learn that they we can't be faithful to god on our own now that's not only a point for them but it's a point for us isn't it i think if we're honest um people are far more faithless than they are faithful now there's some of us our faithlessness is very visible it's it's easily seen We can point to it, whether it be the faithlessness of something we said to a spouse or a child or something like that, something very obvious. Uh, And yet, I think if we're honest uh, and we take a hard look at ourselves, we still betray the faithfulness, betray God by what we think, say, act, and do, even being Christians. I mean, how many of us have 
said to the Lord uh, in the great prayer, Our Father, your will be done, your kingdom come. And yet, God's purposes are conspicuously absent from the arc of our life. Uh, God's ways are not really there, but we tend to be more driven by the culture. You get the point. What, what I'm saying is that if God were to roll out all of our deeds and on the one side had a group of all of our ways in which we were faithful to him, and, and on the other side, all of the ways in which we weren't, the side of faithlessness would be far outweigh the way we've been faithful. And Paul reminds us of that to point to the fact that we need that righteousness found not in what we do but in the faith of Christ and our faith in Christ. Paul has shown us the faithlessness of people. Now, let us see the irony of God's faithfulness. And this is found in verses 4 through 5. After pulling up Abraham and David and making the point that both of these guys learned they couldn't be justified by works, Paul points to an irony. Now, and as an ode to Miss Sarmiento, who taught me what this is, an irony is something... Uh, oh, that's, you deliberately expect to go one way. Uh, matter of fact, you would bet the whole house on it. But then you find out it actually works the opposite. In, in an amusing way, it's a reversal. You think it's going to happen like this, and then it turns out it's completely the other way. It's ironic. And what Paul says is God's faith is ironic in comparison to the world. And here's how it works. Paul says, here's the irony. First... If you think you can be faithful, then you don't need God's faithfulness. Paul brings it up in verse 4 with an example here. Take a look. He says, Now, uh, to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. He says, Now, when you go to work, your check that you collect, uh, the, the benefits that you get, that's not this great gift of faith. It's something that you earned. And what he's saying is, if you believe that you still can earn your way, you don't need God's faithful gift of grace. What, you will, ha what will happen is you'll be given what it is that you're owed. Now here's the other irony Paul says, is those who think they're faithful won't receive God's faithfulness, but those who know they can't be, God's ready to show you how faithful he is. Take a look at verse 5. That's what Paul brings out here. He says, Now, however, to the one who does not work but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. And so what's the irony? God only justifies those who know they can't be faithful. Because if you think you can, you don't need God, right? And that so is different than the way in which we think. And Paul's point is, he says, remember how God works, that God is faithful to those who know they can't, not to those who think they can be. That's what Abraham and David learned, is the irony of God's faith. And in the same way, we have to remember this, because God is working out an irony in your life today. Uh, contrary to the old saying, God doesn't help those who help themselves. What Paul says is that God helps those who know they can't help themselves. God helps those who, who know they're done trying to help themselves. And God wants this to be a comforting truth to you. But I fear instead of it being comforting, it could be a convicting truth. And one of the reasons why this irony is more convicting than it is comforting is because of the issue of pride. I think <laughs> I've never met someone who says, yeah, I want to be known I'm weak. Have you? I've never met anybody who said, yeah, I'm willing to show you and talk with you all the ways in which I've been faithless and can't do it. Never, ever. I've never got a communication card talking about that. No one's ever on a testimony said, let me tell you how faithless I am. Right? And the thing is, though, one of the reasons... I suspect that we may miss out what God wants to do in our life is because we don't want to pay the cost that it takes to admit to the Lord what he already knows, that 
we can't do it. We don't like that feeling. And, 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 and there's, I wonder if there's some breakthroughs that haven't yet happened, if there's some work that God wants to do in people's life, but he's not going to do it until we get to the place to where we can say, Lord, I'm done trying to be faithful to you because I know I can't be, and I'm hoping you will show me how faithful you can be to me. Now, to make you a little bit more encouraged, the greatest Christian ever struggled with this. The greatest human Christian, the Apostle Paul. Uh, read Second Corinthians 12 uh, on your own, but uh, it's a famous passage. And what we learn is that uh, Paul is confronted that God's power can't be fully experienced in his life until he gets to this point. Paul says it like this in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Well, God says it to him. God says, my power is perfected in your weakness. In other words, Paul learned that it wasn't until he got to the end of himself that God was ready to reveal to him how faithful he was. And here's the thing. If you think you're strong, you don't need God's strength. If you think you can do it, you don't need God's work in your life. No, no, no. Only when you know how weak you are is God ready to show you how strong He is. Only when you know how faithless you are is God ready to show you how faithful He is. We must know this irony. And the irony is that yet again, God doesn't help those who help themselves, but He's faithful to those who know they can't be faithful without Him. Having shown us now... Uh, both the faithlessness of people and the irony of God's faithfulness, Paul now drives us to the response that God's faith compels. Paul's going somewhere, and what he wants and hopes is that his church would be compelled, or the Roman church would be compelled to live differently in two important ways. The first is that they would understanding the faithfulness of God, be compelled to love each other freely. Paul addresses that in 9 through 17. Let's go through it together. Um, I'll give you 9 through 12. First thing Paul says is, he says, that God made Abraham the spiritual father of the Jew and the Gentile. That's his first thing he's going to prove. Take a look. He says, is this blessedness, in other words, is this righteousness, uh, is this forgiveness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We've been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? How did it happen? And this clues us in on a conflict that's happening that Paul will address later. And one of the conflicts are, we're not quite sure... The depth of it. But we know at this, at this point, there are some Gentile Christians. And, and, and there's other Jewish Christians who are squabbling over things. We're not quite sure what, but we know it's there. And, and Paul says, now, did it come after or before? Here it is, verse 11. Paul says, it was not after, but before. In other words, he says, the Jewish Christian, Abraham was righteous. Before the law, not before, not after it. If you go to Genesis 15, you'll find that God says, I'll give you a son. And Abraham says, I believe you. And then Genesis 17, which is about 13 years later, or 29 years if you follow Jewish calendar, God comes and says, okay, I want you as a measure of faith to do circumcision. And so what Paul says is, Abraham was made righteous, not as a Jew, not, not, not being circumcised. And yet, before the Gentile Christian could do the mic drop moment or the nee, 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 or whatever it is that kids do when they're arguing, Paul turns around and says, well, wait a minute. To the Gentile Christian, God gave circumcision not as a work to gain righteousness, but as something to express worship and faithfulness. Take a look in verse 11. He says it like this. And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith, while he was still uncircumcised, here it is, so then Abraham is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to him. And so to those Gentiles who don't follow the law, when they place their faith in Christ, God makes them righteous. And here's Abraham. He's the proof of that. 
He was righteous before the law. And yet, verse 12, he is also then the father of the circumcised, the Jew, who not only are circumcised, who not only do the thing, but also follow in the footsteps of the faith they, of our father Abraham. When the Jews believe in Christ and do the law, not as a way to gain things, but as a way to show their express worship to God, that's still okay too. It's drawing to this point that they are, that Abraham is the spiritual father of both. Verse 13 through 15, Paul now says, God has to do it this way. He has to make righteous by faith because that's the only way that the Jewish person gets in and the only way the Gentile person gets in. And he proves that to here. Verse 13, it was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that comes by faith or received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but that, he, but that through the righteousness that comes by faith... I want you to underline, circle that word, heir of the world. This is a part of Abraham's promise. And you'll remember that when God made a promise to Abraham, he said, now part of my blessing is that the whole world is going to be universally blessed through you. And so Paul says, on the one hand, if God only makes righteous the Jews, those of the law, then how is he going to make good on his promise to Abraham? He brings that up in verse 14. He says it like this, For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing, and the promise is worthless. In other words, God was blowing smoke up Abraham. Uh, God was, being, uh, was, was, was baiting and switching him. He was promising him something he never intended to do. That ain't right. And yet also... If God only makes us righteous through the law, then we're going to have more of God's wrath than God's grace. Because when he looks at the ways we've been faithless, he's going to find more opportunities to punish than to bless. Take a look in verse 15. Because the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. And so Paul's made two big points. The first is he said... In Abraham, he is the spiritual father of Jew and Gentile. And God had to do it this way so that God could make good on his promise and so that both the Jew and Gentile could get in because they couldn't be righteous on their own. And this is all driving Paul to a point he wants to make. And one of the points is that God's faithfulness needs to compel the church to freely love each other by focusing on our common identity in Abraham and not the other things. Take a look, verse 16 and 17. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. In other words, he says it here, he is the father of us all. In other words, don't squabble. Why are you... uh, Tripping over Jew and Gentile, Abraham was made righteous before the law, and yet God gave the law as a faithful response. And if God didn't do it this way, none of you would have been in. And yet, because you're all righteous by faith, guess what? He's your father, your brothers and sisters. His faithfulness should compel you to love each other freely and not divide on cultural identity, on racial identity, on other identities. That's part one. But the second part, Paul says, is there's another way this God's faith needs to compel a response. One is to love freely, but the second is to live faithfully. And he brings that part up in verse 18 through 25. And he says, first look at Abraham's faith. The the crux of Abraham's faith was that he believed God's promises were more trustworthy than what he could see says it like that, against all hope, Abraham in hope, believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it has been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since that was about a hundred, since he was about a hundred years old 
And that Sarah's womb was also dead. I feel like I don't need to unpack the biological possibilities of this. I think you could understand that Abraham understood physically how impossible it was that God could deliver on what he said he could deliver on. And yet it says about him in verse 20, he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was still fully persuaded that God can do what he promised. And Paul says that kind of faith, the faith that's persuaded in God's promises more than what a person could see is the kind of faith that not only justifies, but it's the kind of way I want you to live. And Paul pulls that point out in verses 23 through 5 saying this, the words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. In other words, all who believe that God can bring life from death, just like Abraham believed God can bring life from the dead body and dead womb of Sarah, will be justified by faith and give glory to him. And Paul says, I want you to get this. And he says, what I want is I want you to be compelled by the faithfulness of God to love each other freely, which is to see each other as children of Abraham. And I want you to live faithfully, which is to trust in the promises of God more than what you could see. That's what I want you to do. And as we look at this text, we have to ask, what's the spirit want us to do? We're not the original Roman church. And yet I still think this application is for us. Is that we should be compelled by the faithfulness of God to love freely and live faithfully. One of the ways we need to be compelled by this is to see one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. We have an election in what? 15, 16, 14? Come on, I got big, I know some big news watchers here. 14, 15, 16 days, let's just say. Major, major cultural moment about to take place. Certainly, I'm sure there are people on different sides of this. Brother and sister, focus on the commonality you have in Christ more than the differences you have in policy. That's what God wants us to do. Yet he also wants you to live faithfully he, he, in, in, in the sense that he doesn't want you to waver about who God is, about what he said. Now you get that. And, and I want to ask you, is that you today? Do you, are you compelled by his faithfulness to love freely, to live faithfully? Or do you struggle like me? You see, here's, here's the problem. In our hearts, we mess up the order. God says his faithfulness compels my faithfulness. One of the ways I mess up the order is I think my faithfulness compels God's faithfulness. Uh, if I'm faithful to God, he'll be faithful to me. If your heart is believing that today, let me warn you that you've left on the gospel now. Be, and all this will do is, number one, instead of living faithfully, you'll live fearfully. If you think that your faithfulness somehow keeps God faithful to you, you know what's going to happen? You're going to become very transactional with God. You will only pray to get things. You will read the Bible as a way to keep God on your side. And you won't take the risks God wants you to take in your life because you're not ever sure how he's feeling about you today. Is that where the Holy Spirit is revealing your heart is this morning? Turn back. Remember, it's his faithfulness that compels yours, not your faithfulness that keeps him faithful. Not only will you live fearfully, but if you believe that, instead of loving others freely, you'll have a hard time noticing others at all. When your heart gets into believing that your faithfulness compels God's, when you meet others, you will uh, immediately uh, draw comparisons. Oh, well, their kid did this. Well, what about my kid? And you'll never be able to just see someone as to who they are and, and celebrate them. But everything will be a competition. You know what we also will do? 
you'll be quick to notice the distinctions you have in culture instead of who you are in common in Christ. You'll notice, oh, that person's older. He doesn't like that music. That person's different. Instead of realizing, like Paul says, we're all children of God. We're all children of Abraham. And if you're there, your heart's not resting in the gospel, go back. He'll be faithful to restore you. The heart that believes my faithfulness compels God's faithfulness is a heart that lives in fear and is a heart that cannot love. Now, that's one ditch. Let me give you the other ditch. Another ditch is not your faithfulness compelling God's faithfulness, but his faithfulness freeing you from thinking that I have to be faithful. Maybe some of us are not all here. Some of you might say, well, I know that I don't need to be faithful. I know that he was faithful. That's half true. The person who believes this in their heart has no holy compulsion at all. There's no drive to get more deeply rooted. There's no desire to grow together. There's no desire to bear fruit for something apart from themselves. And if that's you, let me ask you, ask God what you're really being compelled by. Because you may think that you're free from the rules, but what in reality is you might be compelled by your impulses. You might be driven by your desires. You might be going to whatever you fancy. You see the two ditches? One is, my faithfulness keeps God faithful. Mm -mm. The other is, God's faithfulness prevents me from being faithful. No, 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 no. The Christian life is about His faithfulness compelling our life of faithfulness, driving it, transforming it, growing it, leading us. And if you're in one of those two ditches, the way out is the same for both. So don't worry. Don't think that, oh, crud, I got to get on my Bible reading plan to keep God. Don't do that. That's a common mistake to go from one to the other. There's only one way to get out of this, and that's to be captured by the excellence of God's faithfulness to you in Christ. That's the only way. That's the only way to really be compelled to live faithfully. And let me show you the place where Jesus Christ loved freely and lived faithfully by the promises of God. If you will, you can go with me here if you want, if you want to. Matthew in 26, we come to an interesting point. And what I want you to see is that uh, Jesus Christ was compelled by his father's promises. At the last supper, Jesus is about to await, deal with the, the greatest suffering ever. But, but in being compelled by his father's faithfulness, he says these words in Matthew 26, 28. He says, now listen, this is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for you. And he says, I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine now on until the day when I drink it with, with you in my father's kingdom. Down to verse 31, he, he warns Peter and he says, now stuff's going to happen to me. But look at what my father said to me in verse 32. After I've risen, I'll come back. In other words, Jesus was compelled by his father's promise of a kingdom and that his father's promise of coming back and rising. And that compulsion, that, that, that trust in his, what his father said drove him to love freely those who've left him. We see in Matthew 27, uh, the cross. In, in Matthew, every writer talks about it differently. Some said he, 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 he bowed his spirit. Others said he, he did this. But Matthew tells us this, that on the cross, Jesus gave up his spirit. It's interesting. Matthew tells us that because our Lord was compelled by the promise of his father, he was able to freely love and give up himself for those who've been faithless to him. You see that? Only when you see that Christ was compelled to faith because his father was faithful to him. And only when you see that being compelled by that trust can drive you to love freely. Only when you see that will you stop thinking that I have to stay faithful or God to be faithful. And when you start realizing that I, I want to be faithful to the things God's done 
because of how faithful he's been to me. And brothers and sisters, when you remember his faithfulness compels yours, you'll live more by the word than the obstacles you see. You'll say, you know, I was talking to my son about Bible study and he asked me where third Hezekiah was and I looked in the table of contents only to be embarrassed that he knows more than me. And I shut it down. But she'll say, you know, God's word can be trusted. And his word never returns void. And, and so because his word is faithful, I'm going to keep going, knowing that even if I can't see it all, God's doing something. I, I know he is. Some of you will say, I'm nervous about this next step that God wants me to take. But I could trust God with the unknowns in my life because he was faithful to take my life and give me his. When you are compelled by his faithfulness, you'll be able to live in faith more than what you can see. Let me ask you, what ways is the Holy Spirit wanting you to hope in God's word more than what you can see? I'm encouraged by some people who said to me, You know, we're done trying to think that we can make this relationship work, but we're now ready to see if God can do it. Once you get to that place, then you're close to God working on your life. Because you've gotten to the place to where you're said, I'm going to trust, not what I can see, but I'm going to trust in the faithfulness of his promises. When you are compelled by that, you will trust God's word more than what you see. Let me also tell you, when we see his faithfulness compels ours, you'll love each other more freely. Uh, let me encourage you with this. We've had some guests leading our worship, our brother Tim and others, and I got the opportunity to talk and get some feedback. And uh, one person said to me, you know, when I came to Laurelwood, I felt like people saw and were interested in me, not just the way in which I could serve them. And I said to myself, you know, You can only see people if you're fully secure in how God sees you. So keep up the good work. Keep doing that. Keep going there. Uh, I got another encouraging card last week. Somebody said, we have to be ready to be aware and, and be open to any and every background that this, that, that our future worship pastor has. And I said, that is somebody Who's, gun, who's getting it. That's somebody who's saying, I'm not going to divide on gender, age, culture, but I'm going to hold on to my commonality I have in Christ. That's someone. Keep going. Keep doing that. And so, brethren and sisters, as I close now, the word from the Spirit this morning is that His faithfulness compels our faithfulness. That's what this text tells us. Abraham learned this. David experienced this. And we have been the recipients of this in Christ. Because he faithfully lived in the promise of his father. And because he freely lived in love. We can now live by faith and not sight. And freely love by focusing on our commonalities in Christ. Instead of our distinctions. I'm going to invite Tim up now. And as we go to our reflective prayer, I have two questions I want to ask you for you to consider before the Lord. The first is, where do you need to live by God's promises more than what you can see? That's the essence of the Christian life, isn't it? Placing our faith in the trustworthiness of God more than what we can see. The God who brings life from death. But also second, where do you need to love by seeing one another as a brother and sister instead of other cultural distinctions? The first, where do you need to live by his promises more than what you can see? The second, who do you need to love by seeing them as brothers or sisters in Christ? Take your time now.